In a quiet night near the city of Jerusalem, an Arabian man sat on the top of a hill watching the camel herd that settled below it. And despite keeping an eye on the herd, his mind was busy thinking of ways to get profit from his trade. This Arabian man was a part of a group of Quraysh who came to Palestine for trading, and this was his turn this time in guarding the herd. But while the man was absorbed in his thoughts, he was surprised by an old Egyptian man coming to him in great fatigue and asking him to give him some water to quench his thirst. It was sweltering that day, and it was clear that this man had walked a long distance without drinking any water. And due to the generous nature of the Arabs, this Arabian man gave him his own bottle to drink from. So he drank until he was satisfied. Then he sat under the shade of a nearby tree and fell asleep. So the Arabian man left him and continued watching the camel herd. But after a while, a large snake appeared from one of the holes next to the old man and was preparing to pounce on him and bite him. So this Arabian man quickly got up and used his bow to shoot an arrow very brilliantly into the head of that serpent before it bit the Egyptian man. When the man woke up and found the snake next to him dead, he understood what was going on while he was sleeping. So he went toward the Arabian man, kissed his head and then said to him, God has revived me with you twice, once from thirst and once from this snake. So tell me, why did you come to that country? The Arabian man said, I came with my friends to ask for credit in our trade. The Egyptian said, how much do you hope to get from your trade? He said, my hope is that I get enough to buy a camel. I only have two camels and I hope to own another one. So the Egyptian told him, how much is one's blood money worth among your people? He said to him, 100 camels. So the man said, from where I came from, we deal in dinars and we are not camel owners. How much is that in dinars? The Arabian man said, that is worth a thousand dinars. So the Egyptian said, I am a strange man to that country, but I am a deacon who came to pray in the church of Jerusalem and walk in these mountains for a month and I have done it. And now all I want is to go back to my country. Can you follow me to my country? And I promise to give you two blood money because Allah has saved me by you twice. The Arabian said to him, and where is your country? He said, Egypt in a city called Alexandria. But the Arabian man said, I don't know it and I never went to it. The deacon said, if you had seen it, you would have known that you had never seen anything like it before. So the Arabian said, will you fulfill for me what you say? He said, yes, and I will return you to your companions. So he asked, how long will we stay? He answered, a month. We will go in 10 days and you will stay with us for another 10 and come back in 10 and I will send someone with you to bring you back to them safely. So the Arabian man went to consult his friends and agreed with them to wait for him until he came back on the condition that he would give them half of what that man would give him. And the Arabian man actually set off with the old deacon until they reached Alexandria. He was very surprised to see the buildings, the large number of people and money and goods in it. The deacon honored his Arabian guest and dressed him in good clothes. And at that time, there was a big feast in Alexandria where nobles and princes gathered having fun and played. So they used to sit in a council and throw a golden ball and the princes tried to receive it with their sleeves. There was a belief among them that whoever received the ball in his sleeve will rule Egypt in the future. So the deacon came with his guest and they sat in that council watching the nobles while, th while they were playing. And one time, Someone threw the ball and it flew until it fell in the sleeve of the Arabian man. There was silence in the place for a while before someone said, The ball has never lied to us before. But do you see this Arab rules us? This will never be. So the laughs started. Everyone then continued their celebrations not knowing that this Arabian man in whose sleeve the ball fell will be at the head of the army that will enter Egypt a quarter of century from that day. This man's name was Amr ibn al-As.
The story of the conquest of Egypt started several years before Muslims entered it. In the 6th year Hijri, specifically after the Hudaybiyah Treaty and the return of the Prophet to Medina, the Prophet, peace be upon him, met with his companions. He announced that he was going to send men to all earth's kings to convey his message to them. Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a was chosen to be the Prophet's envoy, peace and blessings be upon him, to al muqaqqus the ruler of Egypt. Hatib actually traveled to Alexandria where he found al muqaqqus sitting in a palace overlooking the sea. So he crossed the sea to him and told him the message of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And a long conversation took place between the two men. al muqaqqus admired in it the eloquence of the Prophet's envoy and realized the sincerity of the message of the Prophet but he was afraid to announce it so that the Romans and the people of the city would not turn against him. However, he sent gifts with Hatib to the Prophet's peace be upon him, and he also sent him two women who were of great importance to the Copts. Maria the Copt, whom the Prophet took under his arms, where she gave him birth to Ibrahim, and her sister, whom the stories differed about the identity of who married her. And after the death of the Prophet, and during the caliphate of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, he sent Hatib again to al muqaqqus and concluded a truce with the villagers on his way. And that was the first truce in Egypt. And the conquest started during the reign of Abu Bakr. The Muslim armies first began to subjugate one tribe after another during the wars of apostasy, until the Arabian Peninsula was united under the banner of Islam. Then under the leadership of Khalid ibn al-Walid set off towards Iraq where it met with the Persian armies and was able to achieve one victory after another over them. At the same time, the Islamic armies were deepening into the lands of the Levant and achieving many victories over the Roman army. Amr ibn al-As was one of the four commanders of the conquest chosen by the Caliph and was in charge of the Palestine sector. And this continued in the Caliphate of Omar until the 18th year after Hijra. At this time, the Muslims had been able to conquer the Levant and expel Heraclius, the king of the Romans, from it. And the same went for Iraq, which was conquered by them. They even reached al madain the capital of the Persians, and continued their quest east to conquer the various provinces of Persia. And when the plague of Imwas, which spread in the Levant, was over, and many of the companions of the Messenger of Allah, and many men who participated in the conquest, were martyred, and things started to settle down a little bit, Thoughts about conquering Egypt began to develop, but there are many stories regarding the beginning of the conquest. The first one said that Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, wanted to be assured of the situation in the Levant. So he walked from Medina until he reached the city of Jabiya, and there he met with Amr ibn al-As who took command of the Islamic armies in the Levant, after the other three leaders of the conquest were martyred in the plague. Amr ibn al-As wanted to talk with him about going to Egypt. So he told him, O commander of the believers, allow me to march to Egypt. If you annexed it, it would be a power for Muslims and a help to them. It's a very prosperous land and very weak to fight. The commander of the believers was scared at first, but Amr ibn al-As kept insisting on him and enumerating the advantages of entering the country until Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said, Go, and I will ask God for help in your walk and my message will come to you soon. So if my book reached you with orders to leave before you enter Egypt, then leave. But if you entered it before the message reached you, continue in your march and ask God for help. So Amr ibn al-As marched the same night with an army of between 3,500 and 4,000 fighters. And he continued his march until he reached the city of Rafah. And there he received Omar's letter, so he was afraid that it may contain orders for him to leave Egypt. So he procrastinated in receiving the message from the Prophet until he reached a village between Rafah and Al-Arish and it was said that it was the first village in Egypt. So he opened the message and read it to the Muslims and the people agreed with him to continue the march as long as he knew what was mentioned in the message while he was inside Egypt. And this was a clever trick from Amr in which he was able to implement what he intended. The second version says that Amr ibn al-As marched from Palestine to Egypt without the permission of Omar, may Allah be pleased with him. So Omar wrote for him to return immediately if he didn't enter Egypt. But when Amr asked about the village they were in and knew that it is in Egypt, he said, thank God, 
and advanced with the army. As for the third version of the story, it stated that Amr ibn al-As was besieging the city of Kaysariya when Umar ibn al-Khattab was in Jabaya, so he sent for him asking to enter Egypt. Then he took his friends in complete secrecy and marched them towards Egypt. So the army princes resented and sent to the commander of the believers to complain to him. So Umar may God be pleased with him, sent the same letter to him and Amr received it when he was already on Egyptian territory. As for the last version of the story, it said that after the conquest of the Levant, Umar ibn al-Khattab may God be pleased with him, sent a letter to Amr ibn al-As urging him to gather people and take them towards Egypt. It was under the control of the Romans and may be their entrance to the Levant, threatening the lands annexed by the Muslims. Amr indeed did that and took the army towards Egypt. But when Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with him, knew about that, he made the commander of the believers have second thoughts, saying that Amr ibn al-As loves being in leadership. He was afraid that he might go there in small numbers and cause the destruction of the Muslim army. So Umar regretted sending those orders and sent to Amr ibn al-As to go back if he didn't enter Egypt. And after some research, I found the second novel to be the weakest and the first to be excluded. It was impossible that Amr ibn al-As left without the permission of the commander of the believers and that Umar may Allah be pleased with him would leave him unpunished and even provide him with men after that. As a year earlier, when Ala ibn al-Hadrami attacked Persian lands across the sea without Umar's permission, Umar may Allah be pleased with him, punished him and removed him from ruling Bahrain and sent him to work under the command of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. Therefore, this version of the story is the weakest. The second version to be excluded is the third one which talked about Amr ibn al-As abandoning the army during the siege of Caesarea and heading with his men to Egypt. This version came in the book of the conquest of Egypt without attribution and the book of the conquest of countries without attribution as well. Therefore, the closest version to the truth are the first and fourth novels which stipulated that Umar may Allah be pleased with him allowed the forces of Amr ibn al-As to go out to Egypt provided that they return if his book came to him before he entered Egyptian territory. But if they had entered it, he was to complete what he started and Umar may Allah be pleased with him will provide him with men. Therefore, this version of the story is what I will rely on in my talk. Amr ibn al-As marched with his army from Palestine until he passed through Halal mountain before reaching Al-Arish and there were tribes from Rashida and Lakhb living in that place. So it joined him until his army became 4,000 fighters, 3,500 from tribes of Aq, a third of them from a division in it called Ghafiq and 500 from the Rashida and Lakhb tribes joined them. When he arrived at Al-Arish and that was on the 10th of Dhul Hijjah in the 19th year after Hijrah, it was a feast for the Muslims and they stayed in the city for several days. And in that period, the news of the Muslims march reached the Romans in Alexandria. So the state of alert spread. They began to assemble the troops and send them to their first garrison that would face the Muslims, which was the Pelusium garrison. The garrison of Pelusium was considered the key to entering Egypt. All the raids that came from India had to first pass through them, in order to be able to cross to Alexandria in the north or Memphis in the south. It therefore had to be well supported by the Byzantine forces. When the Muslims continued their march after the end of, after the end of their feast and arrived in the city, they found it heavily fortified. In it, the soldiers were stationed and they brought supplies in preparation for any siege. The city also overlooked the coast, so it was easy to bring supplies through the sea, so the Muslims imposed a siege on the city from the mainland side, but they couldn't prevent the people from entering or leaving the city from the sea. So the siege lasted for two whole months and in one of the novels three months, and the Byzantines managed to repel all the Muslims attempt to attack them, until it was one night when a force from the Muslim army was able to penetrate the defenses of the Romans and take control of the city gate. The Muslim forces stormed then the city and the Byzantine defenses collapsed at once. And that was on March 641 AD. The fall of the city of Pelusium aroused the attention of everyone in Egypt. The entrance gate to the country was now wide open and a new army has already invaded it 
coming from the east. The news reached Pope Benjamin I of Alexandria, who ran to Upper Egypt. He wasn't surprised by the fall of the Byzantines in front of the Muslims. He was following their news in the Arabian Peninsula and expected that this would happen as soon as they entered Egypt. And he heard a lot about the tolerance of Muslims when they entered any city. Therefore, he immediately wrote to his Coptic followers all over Egypt and told them that the Roman rule over them was about to disappear and that they should support the leader of the Muslims in order to get rid of the religious persecution that has always been inflicted on them at the hands of the Byzantines. The Coptic church in Alexandria was at that time contrary to the church of Constantinople in belief about the nature of the Christ. The Byzantines often tried to force the Christians in Egypt to join their doctrine and practice various kinds of persecution against them which made Benjamin, the patriarch of the church, to escape from Alexandria with the arrival of the new Almacaucus to power, who intended to arrest him. And since Benjamin was loved by the people of Egypt from the Copts, they received his message with love and agreed to it. And everyone became waiting for the next step of the Muslims. After the fall of Pelusium, Amr ibn al-As had two goals to choose between. He had to determine either to penetrate the territory of the delta and head immediately to Alexandria, the capital of Egypt, and establish a siege until he stormed it and expelled the Romans from it totally, or to go around the agricultural lands and head south in the desert, and then turns around and goes to Alexandria from that side. Amr chose the second option because it was the most logical, as walking in the desert was preferred by the Arab men who had always been used to walking in it rather than the agricultural lands that are strange to them. They were also going through the winter season and the agricultural land will be full of mud and it will get worse when it rains and the Nile floods on them. Moreover, there were Roman garrisons in the south that could pounce on the rear of his army if he went to Alexandria directly and they had to deal with them first in order to secure their marsh. He therefore decided that his next target would be the Roman garrisons in the south until he reached Memphis or Manf as the Muslim knew it, the second largest Egyptian city at that time. Although Alexandria was considered the most important city due its being a naval base through which the Byzantines controlled maritime navigation in the Mediterranean, however, the city of Memphis was considered the communicating point between the north and south of Egypt and controlled the movement between them. From there, he can launch attacks on any coastal city without fearing anything, but getting to the city wasn't easy. He first had to bypass several Roman garrisons on the east of the Nile River to reach them. The largest and most fortified of these garrisons was the fortress of Babylon, which was connected to the western end of the Nile by means of a large bridge. The fortress of Heliopolis or Ain Shams was located 10 miles northeast of this bridge and between Babylon and Memphis forts, several small islands were located in the Nile, the most important of which was Rauda Island, which connected them. Therefore, Amr ibn al-As had to control all these places first before he could go to Alexandria. So when Amr ibn al-As marched from the city of Pelusium, heading towards Belbis, Al-Mukaukus, who was called Cyrus, knew his ultimate goal immediately. So this man got up and left a garrison in Alexandria and marched with 20,000 Byzantine soldiers for a few days to the city of Babylon. There was a garrison of 5,000 soldiers settling under the command of a man called Theodorus, whom the Muslims knew as the lame. When the Byzantine armies reached the city, they blended with the garrison in the city and immediately began preparing the fort for the expected siege. So they brought supplies, weapons, and food in abundance. And since the number of the army was huge and bigger than the city's capacity, the majority of the army had settled outside the city walls. And so that they are safe from any attack, they dug a huge trench in front of their camp and made it more difficult to penetrate the fort. They left only a few corridors in order to make it easier for them to cross if they wanted. But they spread iron caltrops in it to stop any attack by the Muslim knights. And near the city, the fortress of Heliopolis was also preparing with its troops for any expected attack. But there was no coordination between the two forts. In the meantime, Amr ibn al-As 
had finally succeeded in taking control of the city of Belbis after a siege that lasted for a month. Then he continued his march and passed by the Ain Shams fort until he finally reached the most important fort which was Babylon fort. And there the Muslims were surprised as they saw a large force of Romans settling on the walls of the fort and in front of its gates and so the fortifications they had erected represented in the trench and the iron barricade. But what really amazed them was the view of the impregnable fortress with its majestic towers. The walls built of stone were 60 feet high and 6 feet thick. It contained enormous guard towers that increased its defensive capacity. They immediately noticed that the eastern wall of the fort was protected by a group of hills that made it difficult to attack from that side, and the western wall was protected from the Nile River. So Amr ibn al-As realized that there was no way to penetrate the city except by attacking from the northern side, where the Byzantine soldiers were stationed. Therefore, he immediately divided the 4,000 fighters into right-left flanks, and he ordered a quick attack on them. Indeed. Muslim men immediately set out towards their enemies, but as soon as they approached, the arrows of the Romans rained down on them from all sides, preventing their advance and began to cause losses among the ranks. So Amr ordered a quick retreat and withdrew with the rest of the army, he then set up his camp near the east bank of the Nile. That night, Amr ibn al-As realized that he was facing an army six times larger than his own and that if he doesn't act quickly, perhaps the Byzantine forces will come out of place and attack his small army and cause unforeseen losses. If he is defeated in front of them, he will be forced to withdraw from Egyptian territory and give up his dream of controlling it. His return to the commander of the faithful will be embarrassing after he convinced him that conquering Egyptian lands would be very easy. Therefore, he had to think of a way to prevent the Byzantine army from going out to face him by any way. There was no way to do this except by repeatedly attacking them violently. Perhaps this showed them how solid the Islamic army is and prevent them from thinking about abandoning their defensive positions. Therefore, in the following days, the scene was repeated a lot. The Muslim army would come out and destroy those who stood trying to confront them in front of the trench very brilliantly and then withdraw before the archers arrows caused great losses among them and after a few hours the attack is repeated again from another side. This continued until Amr ordered that the attack on the Romans stop completely after he was sure of the success of his plan. Amr tried to deceive the Byzantines when he distributed the soldiers into long lines in order to delude them of the large number of his army. But the Romans were not deceived by that matter. They watched him well from the castle and knew what he was trying to do. But anyway, they never tried to go out to fight him. They were aware through all previous experiences that direct confrontations will not be in their favor in front of Muslims, no matter how many they were. Therefore, they preferred to adopt the defensive positions in that fight. Two months passed and the situation continued as it is. Muslim attack and the Romans defend until Amr realized that there was no way but to ask for help from the commander of the believers. The breach of the fort will not be done with this small number of soldiers. Therefore, he wrote to Omar may God be pleased with him and explain to him the situation and his need for men as soon as possible. And since the situation was very stable in Damascus and the Persian lands, Omar may Allah be pleased with him realized that the scene of hot events is now located in Egypt. Therefore, time wasn't wasted and he immediately sent 4,000 soldiers to him. And with the arrival of the new army, Amr ibn al-As repeated his sharp attack on the Byzantines. But despite his destruction of everyone he met, however, he couldn't penetrate the defenses and the situation remained the same. So Amr found no escape except by rioting to the commander of the believers again. The message reached Omar may Allah be pleased with him and raise his fears. Conquest of Egypt wasn't as easy as Amr ibn al-As said. There was nothing new, although he supplied him with more men. Therefore, Omar may Allah be pleased with him, started to think about giving the leadership of the army to a companion who have great importance in Islam and are no less wise and skilled than Amr ibn al-As. And there was no better man than Zubair ibn al-Awam himself to take on this task. 
Zubair ibn al-Awwam was one of the ten promised with heaven. He was known for his intense fighting skills. There was no knight in the entire Arabian Peninsula who was good at fighting with his right and left while he was riding his horse other than him and Khalid ibn al-Walid, may Allah be pleased with him. Al-Zubair ibn al-Awwam practiced in the conquest of Damascus and fought under the command of Khalid ibn al-Walid in the battle of Yarmouk and remained in Damascus until God completed the conquest of Antioch in the 16th year after Hijra. Then he returned to Medina and stayed there for two years. But his soul longed again to jihad. And therefore, when he met with Umar, may Allah be pleased with him on that day, he wished to go to Antioch and continue the jihad against the Romans. But the commander of the believers surprised him when he said, O Abu Abdullah, do you want to rule Egypt? Zubair was silent for a while. He never sought to be the first commander of the army. All he wanted was to be in the ranks of the Mujahideen. He was also well aware of the intelligence and the sophistication of Amr ibn al-As as commander of the Islamic army, and that he was the right man for that. Therefore, he said to Omar, I have no need in ruling Egypt, but I go out as a Mujahid and for the Muslims as a helper. If I found Amr ibn al-As has annexed it, I won't disobey him, and would go to the coasts and fortified it, and if I found him fighting, I will help him with that. So Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, sent 4,000 men as a supply to the army of Amr ibn al-As again. Four men were in charge of them, each of whom was said to be equivalent to a thousand men, namely Zubair ibn al-Awwam and Migdad ibn al-Aswad, Ubadah ibn al-Samt and Kharija ibn Huzafa. When these people reached the soldiers stationed in front of Babylon fort, their morale rose strongly because of the arrival of this number of companions of the Messenger of Allah and the increase in the number of the army to 12,000 fighters. Al-Zubayr met with Amr ibn al-As and they agreed to attack again on the Romans, so that the army might succeed this time in breaking the bond of the Byzantines. And indeed, after a few days, the Muslim army was fiercely attacking the Byzantine forces in front of the fortress and it already succeeded this time in pushing the troops stationed in front of the trench backwards, but they couldn't follow them in time. Muslims were forced to withdraw again as happened in the past months, but after they achieved some success this time. At that night, Al Zubayr met with Amr ibn al-As in the camp of the Muslims. They agreed that it was extremely dangerous to leave Heliopolis fort without being controlled. Perhaps the forces in it will dare to attack the Muslims while the fighting was going on at the fortress of Babylon. So the Muslim forces will be surrounded from all sides and completely destroyed. Therefore, Amr ibn al-As and al-Zubayr ibn al-Awam took a large number of troops in that morning and left enough men to attack the fortress of Babylon. They immediately headed towards Heliopolis fort and as soon as they arrived, the Muslim knights clashed in extreme violence with the knights they encountered and they were able, after fierce fighting, to push them into the fort. So Al-Zubayr ibn al-Awwam set off with a group of the best fighters and they were able to climb the fortress wall and control it. He called those in the fort to surrender. The men agreed to pay the jizya and were happy that the Muslim would forgive them and wouldn't punish them. The victorious Muslim forces returned to Babylon to find some changes had taken place. The Roman forces have returned again and stood in front of the trench after they succeeded in pushing the Muslim forces from this place. The news even spread that for the first time it will try to attack the Muslim camp. Perhaps this was due to their confidence which increased after they repelled all attempts made by the Muslims. And maybe it was because of despair after the news spread of the fall of the fortress of Heliopolis. And indeed the Byzantine troops crossed the trench for the first time completely and began to attack the Muslim forces, and the two sides clashed in fierce fighting, in which the Muslims were able to push back their enemies, but they couldn't penetrate their ranks. Whenever the Romans tried to attack them, the Muslim carry out a counter attack and push them to force them back behind the trench, and the situation continued for several days without any change. One day, while Amr ibn al-As was thinking of a way to end the siege, Kharija ibn Huzafa asked to enter his tent. He told him he had a proposal that might benefit the army. Amr ibn al-As authorized him to speak and he listened to what he had to say very carefully. 
The next morning, the Roman forces began to emerge again from behind the trench, and they were all determined this day to break the thorn of the Muslims. Indeed, the initial forces clashed with the army and began to strike very fiercely, but to their surprise, the Muslim forces began to retreat in front of the intensity of these strikes for the first time in several months. The Roman rejoiced and the shouts spread by increasing the pressure on the Muslims until victory is achieved. The ranks continued to cross the trench and join those who preceded it, and the Muslims were still in their organized retreat back until all the Roman forces crossed the trench. At this moment, 500 Muslim horsemen led by Khalidja ibn Huzafa came out from behind the hills that were on their right hand amid the astonishment of everyone. It was an outgoing plan that depended on taking a force of knights and going around the hills during the night and wait until the entire Roman forces came out to the Muslims, provided that the Muslim army pretended to break in order to pull them away from the trench and with the appropriate signal, troops go out, control the corridors of the trench until they cut off the way back in front of the Roman army. And then the Muslim army carries out a counter attack from the front in coordination with the knights coming out from behind the Romans and destroy their army entirely. And indeed, once the knights outside took control of the passages, Amr ibn al-As shouted loudly and said, Allahu Akbar! The Muslim forces shifted from defense to attack and began to put pressure on the very surprised Roman army. The fighting intensified very much after the Roman army was surrounded from all sides and many men fell on the battlefield. And little by little, the Islamic forces began to tighten the noose on the Romans and cram them in small distance that wouldn't enable them to use their weapons. So panic spread among the Roman army and they tried with all their might to open a gap among the knights which controlled the corridors of the trench and they continued to fall one by one until a group was able to find a loophole so the Romans rushed quickly and started to cross the corridors and flee toward the forts while the Muslim forces pursued them the Muslims finally succeeded in crossing the trench after months of attempts and they started killing the terrified Roman army during its run and when they approached the gate of the fortress the Byzantines closed the gate immediately, leaving those who were not lucky to enter to meet their fate between killing and captivity at the gate. This was a catastrophic loss for the Byzantines on this day. The imperial army was defeated in an open battle to the Muslims. All defenses were breached in front of the fort and the attackers reached its walls. Although they couldn't get in, but the impact of that defeat was severe on al muqawqus especially after he saw Amr ibn al-As reconstituting his forces along the eastern wall of the entire fort and ordering the soldiers to build a catapult in preparation for bombing the walls of the fort. al muqawqus realized that he was in a losing battle and that the walls would fall very soon. So that night he left the fort from the western gate and crossed the bridge overlooking it with his entourage until he reached the island of Rauda. And he left behind Theodorus, the army commander nicknamed the Lame, to defend the fort. After the arrival of al muqawqus to Rauda Island, he ordered a delegation of messengers to address Amr ibn al-As with a special message in which he said, You people entered our country and insisted on fighting us. You have stayed for long as well, despite your small numbers. So the Romans prepared for you with their weapons and tools. This Nile has surrounded you and it's only a matter of time for you to get under captivity. So send us some men to hear what you want, so we may get to an agreement before the Romans come, as no truce would be effective by then, and you shall regret by then. So send us some of your friends to listen from them. al muqawqus kept waiting for an answer but no one came back. He hadn't heard any news about the messenger he sent for two days and two nights. So he panicked and addressed his consultant saying, do you think that they killed the messenger sent to them? Is this okay in their religion? But before they answer him, al muqawqus was surprised when the messengers came back carrying the message of Amr ibn al-As to him. Amr kept them with him for two days and left them free to room in the Muslim camp to get to know them better. 
المقاكس read the message which said there is only one of three between us and you to enter Islam so you become our brothers and you had what we have or the jizya and you have protection from us against those who oppose you or we will fight you until God rules between us and you and he is the best of the rulers المقاكس folded the message and asked the messengers how did you see the Muslims they said you can't differentiate between their high from their low or the master from the slave and if it is the prayer time none of them is left behind so Al-Mukawqis said if these people had faced the mountains they would have removed them and he sent to Amr ibn al-As asking men to negotiate so that reconciliation may be on their hands so Amr sent 10 individuals headed by Ubad ibn al-Samit and a long conversation took place between the two sides Al-Mukawqis tried to lure the Muslims with money so that they would leave the country and he tried to scare them with killing by the Roman armies if they didn't agree to what he offered at that time but Ubadah told him that he had to choose between converting to Islam paying the jizya or fighting them Al-Mukawqis realized that no trick would work with the Muslims therefore when the delegation left Al-Mukawqis advised his followers to respond to them and pay the tribute but they all refused to do so so they gave orders to cut the bridge connecting the fort and Arauda island and everyone decided to continue the fight the muslims continued to bombard the fort for several days despite the byzantines annoyance at that matter but they didn't go out to fight them the fort wasn't much affected by that challenge al zubair ibn al awam remained throughout this period revolving around it trying to discover any loophole that may help in the invasion but one day zubair finally found his way at a point in the southwest wall of the fort in that place there was a gate surrounded by two high towers for guarding but they didn't have any guard personnel all muslim attacks have been focused until this moment on the northern and eastern wall of the fortress the Byzantine soldiers intensified their presence in those places and gradually reduced their presence in those towers until they were completely free of any individual indeed orders were given and everyone prepared and in the middle of the darkness from the night of the 29th of Dhul Hijjah in the year 20 after Hijra Zubair set off with a group of the best fighters carrying a high ladder and set it up at that place and at the same time there was another group led by Shurhabil ibn Hajjia who was setting up another ladder in the southeastern part of the fort and climbing on it and when there were enough men on the walls Al Zubair realized his voice saying Allahu Akbar and suddenly the voices around the fort echoed what he said and Zubair rushed with his men towards the door of the fort to open it while the soldiers scrambled up the ladder until it almost broke and indeed Zubair and his men succeeded in killing the gatekeepers they opened it wide and the Muslim army finally entered the city all the Byzantines in the city were horrified to hear the shouts of Takbir everywhere and only a few tried to repel the rush of the Islamic army that stormed the fort while the rest fled toward the Nile river where hundreds of soldiers were transported by boat to Rauda island and who wasn't lucky has been killed or taken prisoner in the hands of the Muslims thus the fortress finally fell into the hands of the Muslims and the battle of Babylon finally ended with their victory the next morning al muqawqis sent a letter to Amr ibn al-As asking him to come in person to make peace with the Muslims the terms of the reconciliations were agreed upon which included the following the agreement will include all parts of Egypt and the country will be completely subject to Muslims every Coptic man will pay the equivalent of two dinars annually as a tribute to the Muslims provided that all the elderly women and children are exempted from it all lands owned by the Copts will remain in their possession and nothing will be touched if any Muslim man passes through a village or a city he will enjoy the hospitality of the residents and the people for three days before he leaves no cop will be taken prisoner and no individual will be enslaved the Byzantines have the right to enjoy the rights of this agreement and if they agree to it they have the freedom to stay inside the country and if they don't agree they are free to leave without being attacked 
the two parties agreed to all these terms, but they weren't signed until Almocaucus obtained the approval of King Heracles of the Romans. And thus, if the treaty is signed, all of Egypt will be under the rule of Muslims. But if King Heracles chooses to reject it, Memphis and the area east of the Nile River from Babylon to Arish will be under the Muslim rule. And if they want more, they have to fight for it. So, what was King Heracles' response? Things were heating up in the fortress of Alexandria on that moonlight night in the summer of the 21st Hijri year. Despite the success of the Muslims in breaking through one of the city gates that night, however, the Romans' tight defense was able to repel their attack and drive them out of the walls. But despite that, not all Muslims came out of the fort that day, as four Muslim men were stuck in one of the towers when the city gate was closed to the rest of the army. One of these men was Amr ibn al-As, the commander of the Islamic army himself. The men immediately took refugee in one of the rooms in the fort, while the Roman forces surrounded them and mobilized the men for them. So, how did Amr react in this difficult situation? And what happened to the rest of the Muslim men that night? At the end of the 20th Hijri year, the Islamic forces led by Amr ibn al-As were overrunning Egyptian territory with overwhelming success. After it succeeded in annexing the lands of Levant and expelling the Byzantines from it, it entered Egypt in order to secure its lands in Levant and cut off the road for the Romans if they wanted to attack them from that side. Indeed, Amr ibn al-As advanced and controlled one city after another during his march until he was finally able to control the fortress of Babylon after many months of attempts. And as a result, the Egyptian Mokaukus wrote a reconciliation document with Amr ibn al-As, which stipulated that the country would be handed over to Amr, all Copts from the inhabitants of Egypt shall enjoy safety and protection in return for an annual tribute equivalent to two dinars. But this document remained pending until King Heraclius, ruler of the Romans, ratifies it. When the message of Al-Mukaukus reached Heraclius, his anger intensified and he wrote a strongly worded letter to Al-Mukaukus saying, 12,000 Arabs came to you and the number of Copts in Egypt is incalculable. If the Copts hated fighting and loved paying tribute to the Arabs, then you have more than 100,000 Romans in Alexandria with them who possess the power and the weapons. So fight them, you and those with you from the Romans until you die or gain victory over them, and don't have an opinion other than that. Heraclius wrote another letter to the leaders of the Romans in Egypt, in which he stressed his non-recognition of the reconciliation of al mukaukus with the Muslims, and demanded that they join hands and continue to resist the army of Amr ibn al-As. When al mukaukus learned what was said in these messages, he met with the Roman leaders and addressed them saying, By Allah, despite their lack and weakness, they are stronger and more severe than us in our abundance and strength. One man among them is equivalent to a hundred men of us. This is because that death are dearer to them than life. The man from them fight, wishing to be martyred and not return to his family and country. And we are a people who hate death and love life and its pleasure. They say that if they are killed, they will enter paradise. And all Romans, you should know, that I do not get out of what I promised the Arabs, and I know that tomorrow you will return to my opinion and wish that if you obeyed me. What's wrong with you? Don't you want to be safe and protect your money and children for only two dinars a year? So the Roman leaders got up from the council while they were insulting al mukaukus and none of them was ready to surrender to the Muslims and violate their king's order in any way, and they all left the council leaving al mukaukus sad in the midst of his thoughts. So al mukaukus went to Amr ibn al-As and said to him, The king hated what I had done and wrote to me and to the Romans not to accept your consolation and ordered them to fight you until they won or be killed for that. But I wouldn't have gotten out of what I entered into and promised you for it. But my authority extends over me and only to those who obeyed me, me and the copt 
are grateful for you for peace. As for the Romans, I have nothing to do with them, and I shall ask you to give me three promises. Alm said, and what are they? Al Mukaukus said, don't break your covenant with the cup, for my word and their word have come together according to what we promised you. And the second one, if the Romans ask you after today to reconcile with them, don't reconcile them until you take them prisoners and slaves. They deserve this because I advised them and they accused me of treachery. As for the third, I ask you if I die to order them to bury me in the church of Jones in Alexandria. So Amr agreed to these three conditions and agreed with al Mukaukus that the cops would help the Muslim army by building bridges and paving roads during their march from Babylon to Alexandria. Amr ibn al-As remained in the fortress of Babylon for two months when the news came to him of the preparations of the Roman army in Alexandria to fight. It was learned that King Heracles had equipped huge ships full of men in order to help the Romans repel the attack of the Muslims on them. Therefore, he immediately wrote to the commander of the believers and informed him of the developments of the new situation. Omar replied to him and ordered him to march toward the city of Alexandria before the Romans came to them. So Amr left a small garrison in the fortress of Babylon and decided to move with the rest of the 12,000 fighters toward the city. And when it was time to leave, Amr ibn al-As ordered his men to dismantle his tent to leave. But he found one of the men telling him that a dove had built a nest at the top of the tent and laid eggs inside it and that if the tent was dismantled, its young will fall and die. Amr was surprised by that, but despite being the commander who led several armies in bloody battles, but the matter didn't exceed a few seconds of his thinking. He immediately ordered the tent to be left in this place until the young dove grew up and flew away. He gave special orders to the commander of the Babylon fortress to supervise himself not to disturb that dovecote. And after he was assured of the implementation of his orders, he immediately began to move towards Alexandria. Amr walked along the Nile River west to the city of Alexandria, and he had with him a group of Coptic leaders supervising themselves the paving of the road and repairing the bridges necessary for the army's march. But despite that, none of the Copts joined to fight in the Muslim army. They were just providing the necessary support to them. When the news reached the Romans in Alexandria of the march of the Muslims, they got very angry. As they hoped that the Islamic forces would stay in place longer so that they could mobilize more men and pounce on them. But anyway, orders were issued immediately for some troops to advance and occupy several places on the road between Babylon and Alexandria to monitor the Muslims and disrupt them as much as possible. On the third day of the Muslim march, the vanguard forces met with the small forces of Romans in the village of Tarnut on the west of the Nile. The Romans prevailed and fled quickly towards the north, while the vanguard forces remained in place until Amr joined them with the rest of the army. And the next day, the vanguards continued their march under the leadership of Sharik ibn Sumay. But when it became 20 miles away from the Muslim camp in Tarnut, it was surprised by the unexpected attack of a large force of Romans. And because of the intensity of that attack, the balance of Sharik's group was disturbed and it began to retreat back until it took refugee in a village on the banks of the Nile in order to rearrange the ranks. The Romans kept trying to attack the Muslim group sheltering in the village in order to destroy it before the rest of the Islamic army joined it. But the Muslims succeeded in repelling their attacks one after another until the news came that the Islamic army had arrived at that place. The Byzantines abandoned their plan and immediately withdrew to the north before Amr ibn al-As clashed with them. When Amr came, he found the power of the vanguards very exhausted as a result of what they suffered all day in front of the Romans. So he ordered immediately that everyone rest this night and camp in the place. And because Sharik took refugee in that village with his troops, this village was called to this day by the name of Qom Sharik. Amr continued his advance the next day on the western banks of the Nile River. After about 10 miles, he started heading away to the city of Alexandria. The day after his march, 
he met a large force of the Roman army in the village of Soltis near the present day city of Damanhur. Despite the solidity of the Byzantine defense on that day and the intensification of the fighting, they couldn't withstand long the attack of the Muslim forces and soon withdrew towards the north. Amr's forces rested again that night, but early in the morning, Amr ordered the preparation of a new force of vanguards and assigned its leadership to his son Abdullah. Abdullah advanced with his troops and continued on his march until he reached the Creon, 12 miles from Alexandria. And there, he was surprised by a big force of Romans waiting for him, as the Roman leader in Alexandria knew that the Muslims were very close to them. Therefore, he sent nearly 20,000 soldiers from the city and ordered them to stay in the Creon and wait for the Muslims to come. When the Muslims arrived and Abdullah saw them, he didn't waste time and set off quickly with his troops to fight them. But it seems that the courage of the young leader has overcome his wisdom. He was outnumbered by the Romans and strikes rained down from every side on him and those with him until he suffered several stab wounds. So he tried to withdraw a little to rest from these attacks. But after consulting his father's lawyer servant Vardan, he decided to continue fighting. And the two sides were engaged in fierce fighting until the forces of Amr ibn al-As reached the place. The following events were very vague in the sources. There isn't enough information about what happened in the Battle of Creon, but they all agreed that the battle was intense and lasted several days. It had a lot of hard confrontations and fierce fighting, until the Muslims finally managed to break the throne of the Romans and kill a large number of them, and force them to retreat towards Alexandria as a last resort and the Muslims continue to chase them until they finally reach Alexandria. The city of Alexandria was the capital of Byzantine Egypt at that time. It was founded by Alexander the Great in 331 BC, after he succeeded in defeating the Persians and expelling them from the country. He did this after annexing the city of Rakotis, which was in that place, and included it in the plan of the new city of Alexandria. The size of the city increased with time until it became the second city after Rome in the era of the Roman Empire. It was a center of civilization and culture and an impregnable military capital. At the southwestern end of the city was the Temple of Serapium, built by Ptolemy III and with the Pool of Masts, which is still one of the most important landmarks of the modern city now. The temple also housed the Lesser Library of Alexandria, which contained 500,000 books one day before it was destroyed during the Roman era. The northeastern side of the city included St. Mark Basilica, which still stands today, and close to it was the Lighthouse of Pharos, which was considered one of the seven wonders of the world until recently. As for the geographical aspect, the city of Alexandria stretched for 10 miles between the Mediterranean Sea to the north and Lake Mariut to the south, which meant that the city could only be reached from the east and west. But even from these two sides, it was surrounded by impregnable walls, especially on the eastern side, which alone contained three fortresses, and it was said that the attacker had to cross all of them before entering the city. This was the image that Amr ibn al-As and the Muslim army saw when they arrived on the 19th of Jumad al-Akhar in the 21st Hijri year. Amr set up the Muslim camp at a distance from the eastern fortress of Alexandria. He kept contemplating the high walls of the city and realized in a short time that there was no way to penetrate them except by direct attack on the fort. Dodging or circumventing around it won't work as it was protected by water from every direction. He ordered the distribution of troops according to our plan and everyone immediately set off towards the wall. And everyone kept advancing until they were close to it. At this moment, Roman catapult shells were launched and began to rain down on the heads of the Muslims in extreme violence. This was unexpected surprise for the Muslims. Amr ibn al-As immediately ordered the attack to stop and retreat quickly toward the camp. And 
and the events that follow are not very clear, but the sources stated that the Muslims didn't possess heavy siege weapons as they did in front of the fortress of Babylon. When one of the men proposed to build it, Amr ibn al-As didn't agree with him for unknown reason. The sources also indicated that despite the Roman owning the catapult, they didn't use it all the days. My explanation is that they continued to line up the attacking Muslim forces in the following days until the shells ended with them, and their role was limited only to protecting the advance of the Byzantine forces as they went out to fight the Muslims. And already over several days, groups of Romans were taking out and trying to pounce on the Muslim army in an attempt to break their cohesion, but they turned back after suffering a lot of losses. But in one of these attacks, the Romans managed to deal consecutive blows to the Mahra tribe. They beheaded one of the men and took his head with them during their withdrawal. The tribe men got very angry and they said they wouldn't bury the body without its head. Amr said to them, you are angry as if you are angry with those who care about your anger. Bear on the people if they go out and kill a man of them and then throw his head and they shall throw you the head of your friend. And already in the next day, the Roman troops came out again to fight. The men of Mahra's tribe rushed in great anger towards them and were able to kill one of the leaders of the Romans and cut off his head and allowed the Romans after the cessation of fighting to take the body but without his head. So the two parties reached a settlement and exchanged the heads of their friends and each side buried its friend in a way that suited him. The situation continued for two whole months without anything new happening. Amr ibn al-As ordered to move the Muslim camp to a place closer to the fortress. It seems that the Romans didn't know that. They went out this day to carry out a new attack on the Muslims and they were surprised by them in this nearby place. The Muslim forces quickly clashed with them and forced them to withdraw. But during their retreat, a force of Muslim knights chased them and managed to enter the city behind them before the Romans could close the gate. And there was fierce fighting between the two sides in the streets of the city. And the Romans fought against the Muslim knights who were small in numbers compared to their enemies. Twelve of them were martyred before the Romans could expel the rest of them out of the walls again. After this attack, the Byzantines were desperate in breaking the cohesion of the Muslims and they preferred to stay inside the walls to defend it. The initiative passed to the Muslims and they began attacking the walls in the following weeks and managed several times to breach the walls but they were repelled outside the city each time. So the news reached King Heracles and he realized that the city of Alexandria was about to fall in front of the Muslims. This meant the end to Byzantine rule in the region. Therefore, he immediately ordered the preparation of a large force in Constantinople and the preparation of weapons and supplies and announced that he would lead the campaign himself this time. But God wills that King Heracles dies before this campaign leaves its place and the empire was preoccupied with his successor to rule until these crowds dispersed and supplies never reached Alexandria. The morale of the Muslim rose after the news of the death of the king Heracles arrived and they intensified their attack on the castle. As a result, the Byzantines persisted in their defense and even tried many times to go out and carry out counter attacks on the Muslims. And in one of these attacks, the fighting raged fiercely between the two sides and one of the Roman heroes came out and challenged one of the Muslim knights to fight him. So Maslam ibn Mukhallad came out to him who despite his young age was characterized by a tremendous physique. So the two men fought very brilliantly, but to everyone's surprise, the Byzantine dropped Maslama from the top of his horse and almost killed him, had it been for the intervention of one of the Muslim knights. But the fall of Maslama had a severe impact on Muslims. Amr ibn al-As became very angry and insulted Maslama and chained him that he was trying to imitate men in combat. This angered Maslama, but he didn't reply to him, and the fighting raged fiercely that day. The Muslims increased their pressure on the Romans until they were able to take the fighting into the fortress. The Roman forces met quickly to support their companions and began to return the pressure on the Muslims 
until they forced them out of the city and closed the gates. But on this day, four men couldn't go out with the rest of the Muslim army before the gates were closed. And one of these men was Amr ibn al-As and the second was Maslam ibn Mukhalad. So the four men took refugee in one of the Roman baths in the fort with narrow corridors in order to make it difficult to attack them. So the Romans knew about it but they didn't know the identity of the besieged men. So they gathered outside the corridor and sent someone to talk to them in Arabic and say you have become captives by our hands so surrender and don't kill yourselves. The Muslims refused to surrender. The Romans said to them our friends have been captured by the hands of your friends and we shall give you vows not to kill you and to redeem you by our friends. Muslims also rejected that. So the man said may I suggest something which is fair enough for both of us to give us your word and we will give you the same provided that one of you stands out and face one of us. If our friend defeated your friend, you surrender to us and become our captives. And if your friend prevails over our friend, we shall free you. So Amr ibn al-As consulted with his friends and they agreed to the duel and everyone went out and prepared for it. Then a Roman man who was famous for his prose in fighting came forward and they asked for the Muslim swordsman. Amr ibn al-As was about to go out if he hadn't been prevented by Maslama who said what are you doing? You are making the same mistake twice. You deviate from your friends and you are a prince while you know that they stand as one man because of you and now you want to fight though you might get killed. If you are killed it will be a scourge on your friends. Stand still and I will suffice you by God willing. Amr agreed and prayed for him. And indeed Maslama clashed with the Byzantine man and fought for a whole hour until he finally managed to kill his enemy. So Amr and his friends shouted Allahu Akbar and the Romans fulfilled what they had promised them and opened the doors of the fortress for them to get out. So Amr ibn al-As apologized to Maslama for what he had said before and swore that he wouldn't return to what he said again. The Roman didn't realize that they let the commander of the Muslim army flee from their hands that day. When they knew after that they grinded their teeth regretting what they missed. The siege continued after that for a long time and nothing new happened and Umar ibn al-Khattab started to run out of patience in Medina. He sent Amr ibn al-As a message in which he said but after I was amazed at your slowness in conquering Egypt. You have been fighting for two years and that is only because you started loving your life like your enemy and God Almighty doesn't support people except for their sincere intentions and I directed four people to you each one of them equals a thousand men. If this book of mine comes to you, preach to the people and exhort them to fight their enemy and make these four their leaders. Amr ibn al-As read the message carefully and then leaned on Maslama and asked him for his opinion. He said to him, I see that you should look for a man who has knowledge and experiences among the companions of Messenger of Allah. So you make him a leader and he will be the one who starts fighting and brings victory for you. Amr said, who is that? He said, Ubadah ibn al-Samit. Amr ibn al-As was impressed by his proposal and indeed he summoned Ubadah and gave him the command of the army in the next attack. The next morning after the Muslims had finished their Friday prayers, the army lined up with the usual war formation and the four men who were referred to by Umar in the speech advanced them and they were all under the command of Ubadah ibn al-Samit and after a few moments everyone set off toward the city. Unfortunately there is no information about what happened in that attack and how the Muslims stormed the city and all that was mentioned in the sources is that God gave the Muslims victory on that day and forced the Romans to surrender and those who escaped from them escaped at sea by ship and that was on the 29th day of Ramadan in the 21st Hijri year. The fall of the city of Alexandria was one of the most painful blows dealt by Muslims to the Byzantine Empire. The Muslims succeeded in annexing a city that was considered one of the best cities in the ancient world as it was a very important military and naval base for them and greatly reduced the influence of the Byzantines in the Mediterranean who had long dominated it 
and paved the way for the Muslims to penetrate it. But perhaps the greatest importance in annexing the city was due to the fact that it opened the door for Muslims to spread Islam in North Africa, as happened in the following years. After the conquest of the city, al muqawqas came to Amr ibn al-As and asked him to free the Copts who were captured during their participation in the attack on the Muslims. It was difficult for them to be sent to the Arabian Peninsula so that they would be under the command of the Muslims. Amr ibn al-As wrote to the Caliph asking for his opinion. Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, gave his orders that all Copts be freed from Alexandria and neighboring cities, even those who were not covered by the agreement as long as they paid the jizya to the Muslims. He also gathered all the Copts who were sent to Mecca and Medina and various parts of the Arabian Peninsula and returned them to Egypt after he freed them according to the commandment of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, to the Muslims when he said, treat the Copts well, they are blood related to us. So, a large number of Copts converted to Islam after that. And the problem of prisoners has been solved, but the problem of spoils remained as the conquest of Alexandria wasn't a reconciliation and according to the laws of war, all the spoils in the city were owned by the Muslims and the Muslim soldiers insisted on Amr ibn al-As so that he would divide all the spoils among them but Amr was very reluctant to implement this order he knew that this was their rights but on the other hand, he was committed to his covenant with al muqawqis and the Prophet's commandment about the Copt kept echoing in his ears so Zubair ibn al-Awam came to him and asked him to distribute the spoils to the men but Amr refused to do so so Al-Zubayr determined to carry out this order saying that the Prophet had divided the spoils of Khaybar himself but Amr insisted on his opinion and sent to Umar ibn al-Khattab to ask for his opinion Umar replied to him saying to leave the cups money to them so that it wouldn't be difficult for them to pay the jizya for the Muslims and their money would be a source of strength for them in pushing the aggressors away. So the Copts were happy for the decision of the commander of the believers and everyone committed to paying an annual tribute of two dinars only, as happened in the city of Babylon. And the elderly and women were exempted from it. And peace was spread to the ancient city at last. It was hot on that early morning when Muslim forces continued their march into Nubian territory to the south of Egypt. And due to the calm atmosphere that surrounded them, the army forces were moving reassured, but they didn't abandon their guard completely. Although it hadn't met any resistance until this moment, however, Nafi ibn Qais, commander of the Muslim Knights, ordered them to proceed with the usual war formation in anticipation of any emergency. The Muslims were traversing these lands for the first time and they had no knowledge of who might encounter them in it. And while everyone was cautiously walking towards his goal, Muslims were suddenly surprised by war cries coming from everywhere. The Nubian army has suddenly emerged from its hideout which spread in several places around the Islamic army. It was only a few moments before hundreds of arrows were heaped on the heads of the Muslim men. At the end of Ramadan of the 21st year after Hijrah, Muslim forces led by Amr ibn al-As succeeded in storming the city of Alexandria after a few months of siege. Byzantine forces fled on ships, announcing the city's fall, finally into Muslim hands. This had a severe impact on the success of Amr ibn al-As campaign in Egypt. Muslims have loved the city of Alexandria very much. It was very different from any city they had seen before, and its charming atmosphere overlooking the Mediterranean Sea refreshed the souls of those who were used to the heat of the desert and its charming buildings and paved streets fascinated their souls. The opinion of Amr ibn al-As didn't differ much from them. He wished himself to live in the city 
and make it the main Muslim headquarters in Egypt. Therefore, he immediately wrote to Umar ibn al-Khattab, may God be pleased with him, asking his permission to make the city their permanent headquarters. But Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, had another opinion. Throughout the years of his rule, the commander of the faithful was always opposed to any sea or river separating him from the Muslim forces. We saw this when Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas succeeded in crossing the Tigris and the Euphrates River and conquered Taisfun, the capital of the Persians. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, ordered him to go back and stop chasing them and live in a city on the west of the Tigris so that it would be easier for him to help the troops if they needed him. Therefore, Sa'd built the city of Kufa and made it the main headquarters of Muslims in Iraq. Therefore, when he received Amr ibn al-As letter that day, he asked the messenger who brought the letter and said to him, Is there any water between me and the Muslims? The man replied, Yes, commander of the believers, the Nile River. He wrote to Amr saying, I do not like it that the Muslims stay in a place where water separates between me and them in winter or summer. So when Amr ibn al-As read the message in front of the Muslims, he said to them, let us go back to where we had our camp in Babylon. And with that easy, the Muslims decided to return to where their camp was before heading to Alexandria. Amr ibn al-As left a thousand men under the command of Abdullah ibn Huzaifa in the garrison of Alexandria. And he returned with the rest of the army to the place where he left his tent before heading to Alexandria. This site was surrounded by beautiful gardens and fruits. And there, he found a dove that had built a nest over his tent and flew with her young. So Amr ibn al-As ordered that a city be built in that place to be the capital of the country and decided to name it Fustat, which means tent, after the tent that remained in this place. Differences began to appear among Muslims while they were planning to build the city. Each tribe wanted to have the best places alone. Therefore, Amr ibn al-As appointed a committee of four Muslims to develop a plan for construction and solve these disputes. And indeed, the construction process started to go smoothly. The first thing that was built was the mosque of Amr ibn al-As in the place of his old tent. This mosque is still standing and one of the most important landmarks of the ancient city of Fustat at the present time. The first prayer in it was attended by 80 men from the companions of the Messenger of Allah, headed by Al Zubair ibn al Awam, Abu Dhar al Ghaffari, Ubadah ibn al Samit, and others. The construction process began to unfold, and the Muslims built one house after another around the mosque, and Amr ibn al As kept a large piece of land next to the mosque and built a house for the commander of the faithful in it and sent him a message about that. When the message came to Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he wrote to him and said, Why a man in Hijaz would have a house in Egypt? Umar was very ascetic in accumulating worldly possessions for himself and ordered him to make this place a market for Muslims. The process of building the city continued on the east of the Nile River and increased in size little by little until it included the city of Babylon and they became one part together. The construction process also extended to other cities. Amr ibn al-As erected a fortress in Giza to shelter the Muslims who settled there. At that time, a great famine had befallen Medina and the surrounding areas so that it is said that humans and animals have suffered greatly from it and the meat within the animals decreased because of the intensity of hunger and everyone was in a very bad state. Umar may Allah be pleased with him sent a letter to Amr ibn al-As and the rest of the Muslim emirs in the various parts of the state and said, Oh help, oh help. Amr replied, By Allah, I will send you a caravan of food the first of which is in Medina and the last one will be with me in Egypt. Indeed, supplies arrived in Medina from Egypt and Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, personally supervised the distribution of food to every house and in order for supplies from Egypt 
to reach the Arabian Peninsula after that, Amr ibn al-As rebuilt the Caesar Street Canal which was established during the reign of Sinusir III and connected the Mediterranean and Red Sea across the Nile River. And after that, it was called the Channel of the Commander of the Believers. Despite the preoccupation of Muslims with the continuous construction operations in Egypt, Amr ibn al-As mind was busy developing a plan to continue the conquests and secure Egypt's internal and external borders from all sides. When Amr returned to Fustat from Alexandria, he prepared four brigades and sent them to various parts of the country in order to ensure the elimination of any opposition that might cause problems later on for them. So the first brigade was tasked in Heliopolis area and its surroundings, and the second brigade went to Fayyum and the areas of Upper Egypt. The third went to Dumyat area, and the last brigade went to the rest of the places of Lower Egypt. These brigades succeeded in their mission and condemned the rest of the countries to the Muslims in peace and signed the same terms of the peace treaty concluded by the Muslims with al muqawqis Amr then began to think about securing the country's external borders. The western borders still contain some Byzantine fortresses that must be disposed of in order to be secured from their evil. As for the southern borders, it was suffering from repeated attacks by the Nubian people. One of the terms of the treaty he signed with al muqawqis included that the Muslims protect the people of Egypt from raids, including the raids of the Nubian people. At that time, the Nubian viewed Egypt as their booty and often attacked the southern areas of it. Amr therefore decided to send a force of cavalry to secure these borders. Nubia was located to the south of Egypt specifically from the areas extending along both sides of the Nile between the first cataract at Aswan in the north and the present-day city of Khartoum in the south. It has been succeeded by many kingdoms that have long been connected with the various Egyptian kingdoms. At the time of Amr ibn al-As entry into Egypt, Nubia was divided into three large kingdoms, known as the Kingdom of Alwa, the Kingdom of Mukra, and the Kingdom of Nabata from south to north. These kingdoms were in constant conflict with the Byzantine forces that occupied Egypt and often entered into skirmishes against them. However, this didn't prevent Christianity from entering many parts of it, but the percentage of paganism remained high as well. In view of the raids launched by the Nubians in Upper Egypt and the consequent impact on commercial movement, Amr ibn al-As asked permission from the Caliph to send a force from the Muslim army to stop the attacks, secure the borders and explore those lands well. Indeed, a force of Muslim knights set off towards the northern kingdom for this goal. And here, the sources differ about the identity of the army commander. al baladri mentioned that the leader of that campaign was Uqba ibn Nafa, while Ibn Abd al-Hakam explicitly stated that the leader of the expedition was his father Nafa ibn Qais. As for al makrizi he mentioned it was Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh. It is proven that al makrizi confused the first Nubian campaign with the second campaign 10 years later, which was led by Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh, where he combined them and considered them one campaign so we can exclude that narrative. Since the sources also agreed on the birth of Uqba ibn Nafa between the 8th and 10th year after Hijrah, this means that at the time of the campaign he was only 11 years old, too young to lead an army, especially in areas unknown to Muslims. Therefore, the closest narration to believing is the narration of Ibn Abd al-Hakam, which indicated that the commander of the army is Naf was Nafa ibn Qais, and this doesn't prevent that he had taken his son Uqba with him in the ranks of the army. Anyway, Muslim forces entered the Nubian lands and were surprised by the difficulty of walking in their lands and the spread of rocks in it, as the valley was high above the level of the river and it was difficult for water to reach it. So they walked 
in that barren desert for a while, until they were surprised one day by an ambush prepared for them by the Nubian forces. Hundreds of archers came out on horseback and showered the Muslims with a violent barrage of arrows. Muslims have tried to avoid surprise and attack their enemies, but they were surprised by the speed of their escape from the place before the Muslim horses reached them. The Nubians' attacks depended on hit and run, striking quick blows to the Muslims and escaping before they followed them. This has continued in several areas, until the Nubian forces gathered one day and lined up in large numbers in front of the Muslims. Nafa ibn Qais was very happy as he was waiting for the opportunity of direct confrontation with them to teach them a lesson that they will never forget. He quickly ordered his troops to go towards them, but as soon as they got close to them, the Muslims were surprised by the sky rain raining arrows on their heads. The Nubians fired their bows profusely until the sky darkened over the heads of the Islamic army. It is said that on this day, at least 250 Muslims lost their eyes in that confrontation. Nafi ibn Qais found no escape but to withdraw, so he decided to postpone the confrontation and return to Egypt, especially since the goal of that campaign was to explore the territory and the identity of the enemy in order to prepare a campaign equipped with appropriate numbers for them. After the return of the cavalry forces to Egypt, Amr ibn al-As decided to lead the army himself and this time heading towards Egypt's western borders, specifically towards Afriqiya. At that time, the term Afriqiya was known to people as the coastal region extending from Cyrenaica to the east of present-day Algeria. Byzantine garrisons were scattered along the African coast at that time. Amr wanted to cut off the road for them and cleanse the entire area of them. And indeed, over the course of a whole month, Amr ibn al-As marched with the Islamic army forces until he reached the city of Cyrenaica, six miles from the Mediterranean coast. But at this time, the city belonged to the Byzantine state and was known to them as Pentapolis. Muslims were surprised that there was no garrison or resistance of any kind, so the people of the area met with Amr ibn al-As and concluded a peace treaty with him that stipulated that the residents of the city would pay an annual tribute equivalent to 13,000 dinars in exchange for their protection and the preservation of their freedom of religion. After its annexation, the Muslims gave the city the name Cyrenaica, nullifying the Byzantine name for it. The Muslims continued their march in the region, and Amr ibn al-As sent troops to the northwest of the province of Fizan, and the entire area was condemned till Cyrenaica, and the Muslims found the inhabitants of that area very humble and gentle. Amr ordered that part of the tribute collected from them to be allocated and distributed to the poor in the area. After that, the Islamic forces continued their march toward the city of Tripoli. After a while, the Islamic forces arrived in the city of Tripoli and prepared to impose a siege on it. Amr ibn al-As set up a Muslim camp on the hills scattered in the east of the city. He directed his troops to block the road in front of them. There was a Byzantine garrison in the city. The city's direct connection to the sea made it easy for supplies to reach it. And because there were no siege weapons with the Muslims, everyone expected that the fall of the city will not be easy. Indeed, the siege lasted for two full months in vain. One day, eight men left the Muslim camp early in the morning to hunt as usual. But this time, they penetrated so much into the area that they became on the west of the city, where the city wall meets the sea. The men were surprised when they found a gap in the wall leading into the city and the lack of guards on it. So the Muslim men realized that they could penetrate the city from that side. But in a very bold act, these men decided to storm the city themselves without going back to inform Amr ibn al-As and the rest of the army. And indeed, the men broke into the city wall, and before the Romans and its inhabitants realized what was going on, these men 
arrived in the middle of the city and raised their swords in the face of everyone shouting Allahu Akbar. Panic spread throughout. A large part of the Byzantine soldiers believed that the Islamic army had completely stormed the city. So they decided to quickly escape on the ships that were docked in the port. And in the meantime, Amr ibn al-As heard the terrified voices inside the city and heard the cries of the Muslims and realized that the city had been penetrated from one side. Therefore, time wasn't wasted, he ordered a rapid attack on the walls. And since most of the Byzantine soldiers escaped from the city, the Islamic army had no difficulty in penetrating the gates of the city. Amr ibn al-As and his companions succeeded in entering the city and joined these eight men. And thus, the city of Tripoli fell into the hands of the Muslims. The night after the Muslims stormed the city, Amr ibn al-As sent a force of knights quickly toward the city of Sabrata, 40 miles west of Tripoli. When the morning came, the inhabitants of this city had opened the doors and went out to graze their sheep. They were expecting Tripoli to withstand the Muslims for a longer time and didn't know what had happened to it the day before. Therefore, while they were grazing their sheep, they were surprised by the Muslim knights penetrating their ranks and storming the city. It was only moments before most of the Byzantine soldiers were laying dead on the land of the city, which completely surrendered to the Muslims. Several days after the fall of the two cities, Amr ibn al-As sent a message to Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, and told him, God has granted us Tripoli, and there are only nine days between it and Ifriqiyya. If the commander of the faithful wants to invade it and let it fall for the Muslims by the will of God, he can do so. But Umar ibn al-Khattab replied to him saying, no, it is not Africa, but it is the one that divides your army. It is full of deceive and treachery. No one invades it as long as I live. Omar said so because he heard about how harsh this area was and feared for the soul of the Muslims. And with that message, Amr ibn al-As decided to bring the Islamic army back to Egypt. But after annexing most of the Libyan territory on the coast and opening a way for its communication with Fustat in Egypt. And these lands remained on the covenant that they established with Amr ibn al-As for several years before God wills that these lands would be a conflict zone again for the Muslims. But there is another talk for that by God willing. At the beginning of 646 AD, while Muslims and Copts were preparing to start their day after sunrise in a quiet day in Alexandria, everyone was surprised by the arrival of a huge number of Byzantine ships on the city's shores. Ships carrying a large number of Byzantine soldiers, which as soon as it approached the beaches, it began a heavy bombardment over the city. It was only a few minutes until the surrounding lands and buildings were on fire. So panic spread and chaos were everywhere. And only at this moment, the ships docked in the port and the soldiers began to descend on the beaches. And here, the Muslims realized it. The Byzantines came to reclaim the city and eliminate them forever. The Muslim leaders who were appointed by Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, as rulers of the various provinces, felt always anxious when they visited al Medina. Omar was hard and didn't tolerate any negligence in the tasks entrusted to them. He was fair and expected nothing more from anyone than he would have done himself. He used to wear simple clothes and eat little food, and he continued to do so until his death. Therefore, when he always heard about any change for one of his leaders and their enjoyment of the wealth of the countries they had annexed, he immediately summoned them and held them accountable for what he heard. 
he never tolerated the punishment of any of them if they were found guilty. In order to be aware of what is happening in the Muslim countries, he watched his leaders like a hawk through an intelligence network covering all the places. He had an informant in every camp, every city, and in the close circle of every ruler. Therefore, when he heard that Amr ibn al-As had more wealth from Egypt than he disclosed, he immediately wrote an urgent letter to him and told him, We have been told that you have surplus wealth, servants, livestock and weapons, which you didn't possess when I appointed you as Egypt's ruler. Amr ibn al-As answered him immediately and said, Our land is a fertile land and we get a lot of it. Omar didn't accept that response and decided to carry out further investigations. So he ordered a member of Al-Ansar called Muhammad ibn Maslama and told him to go immediately to Egypt to check the wealth of Amr ibn al-As and to take everything that exceeds his right for the benefit of the Islamic State's coffers. He wrote to Amr saying, your message to me is the message of someone who is worried about what he has, and I have doubts about that. I have sent you Muhammad ibn Maslama to check your wealth, so give him everything you have and excuse his hard actions, and peace be upon you and those who follow our Prophet Muhammad. When Muhammad ibn Maslama arrived in Fustat, he was welcomed by Amr ibn al-As who gave him some gifts, but he immediately rejected it. So Amr ibn al-As was very angry at that matter and blamed him. The Caliph's messenger said to him, if this gift of yours was a gift from a brother to his brother, I would have accepted it, but it seems like a gift, but there is a demand behind it. This matter didn't calm Amr's anger. He didn't accept the humiliation he was subjected to at the hands of the Caliph's messenger, especially since he was the commander of the Muslim armies and one of the most important reasons for conquest of Levant, he said in great anger to Muhammad ibn Maslama, May Allah curse the day I became a ruler for Umar ibn Khattab. I have seen days when my father wore a gold robe and his father carried firewood on a camel's back. So Ibn Maslama shouted at him saying, Shut up, your father and his are in hell. Omar may Allah be pleased with him is better than you. And as for the day you complain about, you may find your utmost wish today is to tie a goat's leg to get its milk. So Amr ibn al-As suddenly returned to his senses and calmed down. He apologized to Muhammad ibn Maslama saying, God bless you. Don't tell Omar what I have just said. My tongue slipped and I will repent to God for it. Ibn Maslama reassured him and told him that he wouldn't reveal what happened between them as long as Omar remained alive. So Amr ibn al-As gave him all his possessions, which after the Caliph's messenger checked it, he found it more than what he deserved. So he took from him what was more than his right and returned it to al Madina, and that was in 644 AD. Shortly after that, Another dispute occurred between the Caliph and Amr ibn al-As. Omar, may God be pleased with him, wasn't satisfied with the wealth that came from Egypt. Considering that it has always been a fertile land throughout its history, it had to supply al Madina with more than it actually did. So he wrote to Amr ibn al-As inquiring about that matter. Amr replied to him saying that Egypt no longer produce more as no one is obliged to double the work after the Muslims came to the country and imposed a much lower tribute than what was imposed on them during the rule of the Byzantines. This was better for them and for the lands where no one was under the pressure of doubling work and exhausting the agricultural soil. So letters kept coming and going between the two men until the Caliph asked Amr to send him one of the Egyptians to explain more by himself. So Amr ibn al-As sent one of the oldest Copts to him. When the men arrived, Omar asked him about the Egyptian lands in the past and why they were providing their past rulers with more wealth than they do today. The man was very frank in his answer and said to him, In the past, the rulers were interested in reclamation 
and development of the lands before they took anything from it. But the Muslim rulers were never interested in reclaiming it. They were only taking what grew on its surface. After a year, the tribute was collected annually only from what the land produced, whether it was a little or a lot. So Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, realized that the situation needed a change in the Egyptian territories. Despite the fact that Amr ibn al-As was a brave military leader and capable of leading Islamic armies, but he wasn't the best man in managing the country affairs. So Omar decided to divide Egypt into two states, Lower Egypt in the north and Upper Egypt in the south. Amr ibn al-As should rule Lower Egypt and have his residence in Fustat and Upper Egypt will be under the rule of Abdullah ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Sarh and his place of residence will be in Fayyum. He will personally supervise the financial affairs of the state and this decision was at the end of 644. Although Amr ibn al-As owned in his province the best areas in Egypt, however, he was never satisfied with the caliph's decision, but he couldn't do anything. Omar was not the man who accepted the review of his decisions. So Amr ibn al-As reluctantly accepted the decision and ruled Lower Egypt for the rest of the year until the great tragedy happened. On the 26th of Dhul Hijjah of the same year, Omar was assassinated by Abu Lu'lu' al majusi with a dagger with two blades while he was praying Al-Fajr with his people. So Uthman ibn Affan was chosen to be the third of the rightly guided caliphs on the third of Muharram after that. Shortly after Uthman ibn Affan assumed the rule of the Muslims, Amr ibn al-As visited al Madina to see the new caliph and he took the opportunity to talk to him about the removal of Abdullah ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Sarh from power in Egypt. But he was surprised when the caliph rejected this order, arguing that he had been appointed by Umar ibn al-Khattab and that he wouldn't violate this order. Abdullah ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Sarh was also Uthman's foster brother. So Amr ibn al-As was very angry about that matter and swore that he wouldn't return to Egypt until Abdullah ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Sarh was disposed from it. So when Amr left the house of the caliph, Uthman ibn Affan wrote to Abdullah ibn Abi Sa'd and told him that he had appointed him governor of all of Egypt. Amr ibn al-As was never told about that. He received the news with a severe shock in his home. This was what happened in al Madina, but now let's go back in time a little bit and move to the city of Alexandria. Although the Romans in Alexandria were subservient to the Muslims when it fell into their hands, however, their submission was only outwardly. Those of them who were able to leave for the Byzantine Empire did, but about 150,000 people remained in the city and didn't leave. Although the Muslims allowed them to practice their religion and keep their homes and properties for only two dinars for those who could pay and showed them how tolerant they were to encourage them to stay. However, the Romans continued to harbor hatred towards Muslims and intended to betray them. So they started hatching conspiracies to get rid of them. Shortly after the conquest of Alexandria and while Amr ibn al-As was in Tripoli at the beginning of the 22nd year after Hijra, al muqawqis wrote a letter to him informing him that the Romans intended to break the treaty between them and the Muslims. But when Amr returned from his campaign in North Africa, his prestige frightened those who were plotting conspiracies against Muslims and they preferred to remain silent and not cause problems. And the situation remained like that until the end of the year 644 AD. At this time, the Roman governor of the city of Ikhna near Alexandria came to meet Amr ibn al-As. This man was called Talma. He was carrying a message from the people of his city who refused to pay the tribute to the Muslims. It seems that when he talked to Amr ibn al-As about this issue, he didn't find the response he had hoped for. Amr said to him, the more you give us, the more we will do for you, and the more you detract from it, the less we respond. So Talma got angry from that answer very much. When he returned to his city, he met with some of the Romans residing in it 
and they all decided to sail to Constantinople to meet the Roman Emperor there. Meanwhile, Constant II had taken over the rule of the Byzantine state, and before Talma reached him, he had already received several letters from the Romans in the city of Alexandria, informing him of their dissatisfaction with the tribute imposed on them, and telling him that the Muslims had left a small garrison in the city of Alexandria approaching only 1,000 fighters. They urged him to take advantage of this and come to reclaim the city as soon as possible. And when Talma came to him, he found him repeating the same words and assuring him that the opportunity is now ripped to attack the city, especially after the departure of Amr ibn al-As from power and the appointment of Abdullah ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Sarh instead of him. Unlike ibn al-As, who refused to charge the Copts more than two dinars annually as a tribute imposed on them, Abdullah ibn Sa'd wanted to increase the amount of the tribute and send it to exchequer in El Medina. The Copts and Romans in Alexandria didn't like that, and the state of discontent between them increased. So Constance was encouraged to prepare a campaign to reclaim the city, and his audacity increased after he learned about the conditions of the country and the departure of Amr ibn al-As from it. Therefore, within a few weeks, there were 300 naval ships loaded with men and weapons ready to attack the Egyptian coasts. A Roman commander named Manuel was appointed as the leader of that expedition. He should be assisted by Talma, the governor of Ikhna, who would be the guide of the Byzantine forces in the country. The orders given to Manuel were to storm the city of Alexandria and take possession of it before advancing towards Babylon and defeating the Muslims in a crushing defeat which would drive their end. And indeed, in early 646, the Roman fleet appeared in Alexandria and began to bombard its shores. And since the garrison of Muslims in it included a few men, they couldn't repel this strong attack on them. Byzantine men landed on the ground and soon the Roman population joined them after coordinating with Talma. Most of the Islamic garrison in the city was eliminated while some fled to Fustat to convey the sad news to the Muslim camp there. Words about the arrival of the Romans and their annexation of Alexandria spread everywhere, and everyone was talking about Abdullah ibn Sa'd next step. It was his first real test since he took over the country. Here is a new Byzantine invasion that threatens the presence of Muslims in the entire country. It seemed that the Muslims of Egypt didn't have much confidence in the ability of their new ruler to defeat that aggression. Therefore, they formed an urgent delegation and immediately sent it to El Medina to meet with Uthman ibn Affan. When they met him, they asked the new caliph to reappoint Amr ibn al-As as ruler of Egypt so that he could take over the task of repelling the aggression of the Romans against them. They believed that he was the right man to face the Byzantines. He has the experience of war, extensive knowledge of the country, and the disciplined ability to lead the army, which qualifies him for that matter. His reputation also preceded him, and the Romans feared him a lot, which increased his chances of success over them. So Uthman ibn Affan listened to them and realized their point of view. So he immediately sent to Amr ibn al-As and told him that he had been appointed ruler of Egypt again and ordered him to deal with the Romans. So Amr ibn al-As responded to him as the lawyer leader should do. He didn't let his resentment of the caliph affect his decision and didn't waste time and rushed quickly towards Al-Fustat to take command of the Islamic army and save the people. When Amr ibn al-As arrived in Al-Fustat, the Romans had completely controlled the city of Alexandria and its surroundings, and they already had built fortifications and gathered more men. It was reported that they had begun marching towards Al-Fustat to meet the Muslims. And even though the Copts of Egypt left them and didn't participate in their campaign, however, a few people in Alexandria and its surroundings 
believed that the Roman sun was about to rise again on the country. On the other hand, the return of Amr ibn al-As had a great impact on the hearts of Muslims in Egypt. So everyone started preparing for the battle with great enthusiasm while the commander was circling among them and planning the next step. And in one of the war councils that was held, the Muslim men discussed the latest news of the Romans and learned that they were approaching the city of Al-Fustat. The men suggested that the Muslims don't let them leave the vicinity of Alexandria and that they attack as quickly as possible. Kharija ibn Hudhafa said to Amr, Attack them before their strength increases. There is no guarantee that Egypt will not revolt and join them. But he was surprised by Amr saying, No, let them come to me. By God, the destruction they would cause to those who pass by will increase the hatred towards them. If we look at Amr ibn al-As strategy in battle, we will find that he chose to let the Romans advance away from their base in Alexandria in order to extend their supply line and make it difficult for them to communicate with it. He also relied on the cruelty and lack of discipline of the Romans, which would cause several losses in the places they would pass on, which will anger the people of those areas who will rush to the aid of Muslims, or at least prefer their victory in that battle. Thus, he accepted to lose ground and some of the loyalty of the Copts in exchange for enjoying the strategic advantage and eventually achieving victory. And indeed, the Byzantines advanced without any opposition from the city of Alexandria. They marched on the east bank of the Nile River instead of walking west in the middle of the desert. The Romans always preferred green areas with many plants instead of the desert that the Arabs are used to. Also, by taking this path, they will not have to cross the river to meet the Muslims in Babylon. This road will enable them to cut off the Arabs' communication route with the Arabian Peninsula, which will put the Muslims in a very difficult strategic position. This was the right way to be taken by the Romans and represented a great danger to the Muslims. The Romans walked on land in the roads and sailed on ships in the Nile River. Their progress was slow and deliberate, and as Amr ibn al-As predicted, whenever the Roman army passes by a city, the Roman soldiers drank from the people's wine, ate their food, and looted their wealth. The cup was very angry at that matter, and their hearts became agitated, and they wished the victory of the Muslims. The Romans had traveled half the way to the city of Al-Fustat, when the Muslims started to move for them. Amr ibn al-As left with an army of 15,000 men and advanced along the eastern bank of the Nile River towards Alexandria. And unlike the Romans, Muslims only advanced on the road by land, and they kept on their way until the two sides met in the city of Nikyu. The city of Nikyu wasn't of strategic importance at that time. It was just a vast land where the two armies met full of greenery and flat lands. It was bordered by the Nile on the west and the delta extended to its east. When the two armies were within sight of each other, the tents were hit and each of them set up his camp to be ready to fight. The next day, the ranks of Muslims started to line up in preparation for the battle. Their left flank consisted entirely of cavalry under the command of Sharik ibn Sumay and rested on the Nile River. Amr ibn al-As had intended to initiate the attack but he waited for the Romans to line up in front of him before he gave orders to attack and we don't know the amount of the Roman army in that battle until today. But it must be more than the Muslims as long as they left Alexandria and moved to meet them instead of taking shelter there. Indeed, the Romans started to leave their camp and line up in front of the Muslims in the war formations. But to the astonishment of Amr ibn al-As, a large number of them were boarding ships in the Nile 
and not adhering to the battlefield and when they were all done lining up the fighting signal went off the roman army advanced on land accompanied by the support of the forces that advanced in the nile river amr ibn al-as remained firm in his place with the muslims wondering at what the romans were doing and they stayed as they were until the rows of the romans approached them and here the muslim understood what they intended to do at this moment the romans began a series of heavy bombardment with arrows on the army of the muslims who soon took on their shields to avoid it and at the same time the ships were continuing on their way until they approached the muslim side and when it became next to them these ships docked and the soldiers on board also began to shoot arrows profusely at them muslims were in a very dangerous predicament they were bombed from two different sides although they were able to avoid the arrows coming from the land with their shields successfully however they were unable to avoid those coming from the river this was a genius plan from the romans that confused the muslims a lot an intense attack from the front that makes the army fixed in place until the river forces reach it and initiate an attack on its side causing terrible losses among them and indeed muslims suffered a lot from these arrows many of them were seriously injured amr ibn al-as horse was wounded and fell to the ground chaos increased among the ranks of the muslims while one individual fell after another among them it was clear that the romans excelled in this type of fighting especially with their longer range bows and deadly arrows the ones who were mostly affected by that bombing were the nice battalion that was led by sharik ibn sumay in the left flank it was the first to be bombed and the one who suffered the most losses indeed as a result the nice on that side couldn't maintain their stability and the horses quickly escaped from the hell of the arrows thrown at them sharik went behind them trying to reunite them the romans continued to throw arrows at muslims from every direction in order to cause as much losses as possible the muslims had no choice but to remain in their position despite what they were exposed to hoping that this phase of fighting would end quickly and indeed after a short time the romans stopped throwing arrows and the ships began to reverse where the rest of their army was and when it arrived next to them it docked in that place and the soldiers on board began to descend on the ground and started to take their places among the ranks of the army till they formed several successive rows and once their number was complete they all started throwing arrows again at the muslims manuel's plan was to use the romans experience in throwing arrows as much as possible he wanted to keep muslims at a distance from them without clashing with them in narrow spaces where muslims always show superiority in direct confrontations and when these arrows cause chaos and disorder among the ranks he will order his army to advance and deal fatal blows to those who remain on the battlefield and indeed as soon as manuel noticed the chaos spreading among the muslims he ordered his soldiers to narrow the distances and advance towards the muslims immediately the first deadly phase of the war ended at last and the muslims were very relieved direct fighting was what they always preferred but despite that they suffered great losses and chaos spread among the ranks especially after the frightened horses fled in the left flank which sharik was still trying to control with his riders therefore they preferred to retreat to the back and not clash with the roman army until their ranks were complete and indeed they continued the retreat for a period of time until they became away from the grip of the romans so they stopped in their place and so did the romans believing that they had won and the muslims were carrying out a withdrawal from the battlefield and the two sides remained in their places for a period of time the romans kept waiting in the hope that the muslims will leave 
Muslims kept waiting, hoping that their ranks will be reunited and the battle will be renewed in a better situation for them. And before the next phase of the war began, everyone was surprised to see a Roman commander wearing the best armor coming out of his place and shouting loudly, asking to challenge the best Muslim leaders. One of the brave Muslims, who was famous for his skill and superiority in many duels before, came to him. The two men stood in the distance between the two armies as they looked at each other. Then each grabbed his spear and they immediately began to duel. It seemed that the ingenuity of the two men was the same using the spear. Neither showed superiority over the other and their fight continued for a long time. While the two armies watched them in silence which was cut by some encouragement to their hero from time to time. And after a short while, the Byzantine commander threw his spear and grabbed his sword. The Muslim brought his sword as well, and then Amr ibn al-As shouted encouraging him saying, Come on Abu Mus'haj. The man replied to him saying, I can do it. Then he ran quickly and threw himself at the Byzantine man, and they immediately began to wrestle with the sword on the ground, and then they stood up and continued their struggle for a long time until the Byzantine man managed to seriously injure the Muslim in his body before the sword fell from the hands of both. So the Byzantine man threw himself towards the Muslim so that they could fight with their hands. But as he approached him, the Muslim took a dagger from his robe and stitched it into the neck of the Byzantine man before letting him fall to the ground amid his blood. The shouts of the Muslim spread in the battlefield, especially since the end of the fighting coincided with the completion of the ranks and the return of the knights led by Sharik ibn Sumay and here launched his famous cry and ordered the army to rush towards the Romans. The Muslim army rushed towards their enemies very quickly wanting to compensate for their losses in the early stages of the fighting taking advantage of the euphoria that the individual fight had achieved on their souls and they clashed as soon as they arrived with the Romans in extreme violence who tried to return the blows with the same amount of violence on them but this was in vain as fighting face to face was the most proficient thing Muslims did and indeed the fight didn't last long the intensity of the Muslims blows and their desire to avenge what happened to them casted a shadow at that stage of the war soon the ranks of the Romans began to retreat and the distances between their lines increased and hundreds of them fell. Chaos spread among everyone. The Byzantine army began to retreat immediately and hundreds of soldiers fled the battlefield to save their lives. But the Muslims never let them enjoy a quiet withdrawal till they set off behind them with their horses striking blows to those who fell under their hands and they continued the chase until the fugitives reached the city of Alexandria. The Romans, after seeing that there was no escape from the Muslims, set off quickly and preferred to hide behind the high city walls. When the entire Muslim army arrived in Alexandria, Amr ibn al-As look, looked angrily towards the city walls. The same situation is repeated again after five years. And here he is in another siege that could last several weeks again and all because he was removed from power and replaced by another commander. He was full of anger and swore that if he wins all the city walls so that it become accessible from all sides. The first phase of the siege began with heavy bombardment from both sides. The Romans had set up several catapults on the walls and bombarded the Muslim forces that were approaching the walls with them and so did the Muslims as Amr ordered the construction of catapults as well and the bombing and destruction of the city walls and we don't know exactly how much of the losses that the mutual bombardment between the two sides caused but it seems to have lasted a long time until luck finally smiled for the Muslims in one night one of the city dwellers called Ibn Bassama, who was guarding one of the wall gates, came and made an offer to Amr ibn al-As, 
to leave the gate open to Muslims in exchange for promising to protect him and his family and let him keep his property. So Amr ibn al-As accepted this offer. Therefore, in that night, the man left the city gate open to the Muslims and the army rushed through it like a torrent inside the city and all the Romans who tried to confront that terrible intrusion were pushed back. The anger of the Arabs was intense and they rushed very violently towards their enemy. So the Romans realized that they had no power to fight them and those who escaped from them fled to their ships. But after hundreds of them were killed. One of them spoke to Amr ibn al-As that the Romans no longer have power or strength and need his mercy. And despite all the anger that filled him and despite the hard manners that was known about him, however, Amr ibn al-As ordered his men to lift the swords of the remaining Roman soldiers, announcing the end of the Battle of Niku and the recapture of the city of Alexandria again. The second battle of Alexandria ended with the success of Muslims in recovering the city. Despite the death of hundreds of Romans on its soil, the number of Muslim martyrs didn't exceed 22 individuals. According to Islamic sources, Commander Manuel was killed during the battle, but Western sources confirm that he succeeded in escaping towards Constantinople with those who escaped. Talma, the governor of the city of Ikhna, was brought in front of Amr ibn al-As as a result of his planning with the Romans to come to Egypt and expel the Muslims. The voices grew louder with the need to cut off his head so that he would be an example to those who consider. But Amr ibn al-As spoke quietly and said, No, let him leave and bring us a new army. And that response was a slap in the face of Talma. Amr ibn al-As ordered them to bring the best clothes and let Talma wear them and then he repeated to him saying come on go get us an army like that again Talma didn't say a letter and he left the place with signs of shame filling his face after that the man lived and he was pleased with the generosity of the Muslim leader and never tried again to incite the people or contact the Romans again Amr ibn al-As spent the following days restoring discipline to Alexandria and its surroundings and ordered the demolition of all its walls. He prepared a defense plan different from the previous one. He divided his army into four sections. Part will remain in Alexandria to defend it and a part will watch the northern coasts of Egypt from any aggression. And half of the army will move to Al-Fustat to stay there. The garrison men will be changed every six months so that everyone remained alert and prepared for any circumstances. And after he was assured, Amr ibn al-As left Alexandria and returned again to Al-Fustat with half of the army after he made the Roman army suffer heavy losses and saved Egypt and the Muslims from their rule again. And he had every right to be proud of himself and expected the new caliph to appreciate what he had done. But Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, had another opinion. He was a kind-hearted man, and he wanted his foster brother to have good standing. Since Abdullah ibn Sa'ad was capable at collecting tribute from the people of Egypt, he wanted to reinstate him to his position again as ruler of Egypt. So he summoned Amr ibn al-As to al Madina and told him that he had reached a solution that might satisfy everyone. He offered to keep Amr ibn al-As, the military ruler, responsible for the defense of Egypt, provided that Abdullah ibn Sa'ad would take over the financial affairs of it. So Amr replied, So in this case, I will be the man who grabs the horns of the cow while others milk it. And he declared his rejection to this solution. Uthman may Allah be pleased with him found no escape except by removing Amr ibn al-As again and appointing Abdullah ibn Sa'ad as a ruler over Egypt only one month after Amr's victory over the Romans in Alexandria. And this will remain the case for another 13 years before Amr returns again during the mandate of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. But during this period, the story of the Islamic conquest of North Africa at the hands of Abdullah ibn Sa'd 
will continue. Confrontations with the Romans will be renewed in the terrible battle of Sofitela at his hands. But this is another story to be told in another day. وقبل ما اختم الحلقه خلوني اقول لكم ان عدد كبير بيشتكي من عدم وصول اشعارات اي فيديو جديد بعمله ليهم وعشان نتفادى الموضوع ده بستاذنكم ان انتم تعيدوا تفعيل الجرس من جديد وتختاروا وصول كل الاشعارات الجديده ليكم عشان يجي لكم خبر باي فيديو جديد بعمله وطبعا لو انت مشاهد جديد وعجبتك الحلقه فمرحبا بيك في القناه وبطلب منك انك تشترك في القناه وتشارك الفيديو مع كل اللي بتحبوهم عشان تساعد القناه تكبر وتنتشر انتشار كبير وطبعا هستنى رايكم في التعليقات عشان تقولوا لي رايكم ايه في فيديو النهارده واشوفكم الحلقه الجايه على خير ان شاء 